All right, uh, we'll go ahead and start. So I'm gonna turn it over to my UNC students, Amanda and Shade. Hello. Um, for this presentation, we're popular places in Croatia, Chile, and France. Um, our learning objectives for this uh, will be, students will be able to recognize different landmarks and historical places in France, Croatia, and Chile. Um, we're first gonna start off with an introduction activity just to get us into the mindset and you know, recognize or at least be familiar with some landmarks. Uh, the first landmark, uh, we're gonna have a little game. You basically have to name the landmark. So I'll show you the picture and then you just uh, answer on the poll what you think it is. <laughs> There's the results. Okay, and if y'all guessed Biltmore State, which a lot of y'all did, you are correct. <laughs> um, for our next activity, we're gonna try another picture, which should be popping up now. Y'all could take some time in the polls to guess. <laughs> Here's the results. And you all guessed the White House, yay. That's the number one most iconic landmark we probably have in the US. Um, we have two more to go. The next stuff is showing now. Oh, and y'all guessed correct. It's not Rushmore with our four famous presidents. Um, we have one last one, which will be showing up now. Y'all can take a gander at what this image is. And y'all are right, this is the Grand Canyon. Um, the reason for this little short activity was just to give y'all a little um, glimpse of like, you know, landmarks that we have here in the US and how quick we can, like, can jump to name them. Um, for our places, we're gonna uh, teach y'all about like, you know, some landmarks we've seen there and like the history behind them. Uh, so my name is Shade. Um, I attend UNC Chapel Hill, but I live in Greensboro. Um, for my like study abroad experience, I've gone to Hong Kong during the summer of 2018, and I've been to France just this past summer, um, which is the country I'm presenting on today. Um, I'm a political science ma uh, major with a history matter because I find those two pretty fascinating. Which is one of the reasons why I went to some of these countries, just you know, see the history of it all. So um, I went to France. Here's a little map. Uh, where you can see like the overview of the country. Um, the little two little pin drops you see are the places that I visited, which are Paris and Arles, and one tiny little place that you can't see, Avignon. Um, but they're all located in the south of France, near Marseille, if y'all can see it. So next up, we're gonna start off with the overview of Paris. Uh, Paris is like the capital of France. It's a multicultural historic city. It's pretty much influenced the uh, fashion world into and historical aspects that's happened in Europe um, and a lot of places around the world. Um, and this is the first place I visited, so I wanted to start off by showing you, like, you know, the most iconic landmark that you probably think of when you go to France, or mainly Paris. So first, we're going to start off with one more guessing game. Y'all can answer this in the chat. Can you name what this is? <laughs> Y'all guessed it. It's the Eiffel Tower located in Paris. Um, this is arguably one of the most famous uh, landmarks that you can see while you're in the city. Um, a little circle background behind this whole thing. Originally it was built for like the Royal Fair in like 1889-ish. Uh, um, so it was meant to be just a little prop for that whole cultural like, you know, World Fair where people come um, all over the world come to like show off their projects, show off what they've learned and just in general have a good time. Um, however, like for the most part, it wasn't a well-liked idea initially. Um, this movement uh, of the artists, artistes, um, initially rejected having the Eiffel Tower built because it was such an eyesore, um, what, is what they originally thought. Um, but eventually, like, you know, after everything had gone through and passed, they were supposed to actually also be constructed, like, taken back down. But it kind of came so famous and people liked it so much, it just kind of left it there. Um, and so far now, it's the tallest building in Paris. Like, nothing else kind of reaches its height. And in addition, it's now become one of the most visited places in the world. People come from all over to visit. Uh, and take pictures. You can actually go up it in an elevator, or you can actually take the whole flight of stairs. When I had gone and visited that, um, I ended up taking uh, the elevator because the stairs were a bit extreme for me, not the most athletic. 
but we did take it halfway back down and it's a lot of stairs but it would be like a fun activity to do because you can take pictures along the way up and the higher you get the more the Paris like skyline you can see really <laughs> um for the next iconic landmark that I had gone to was uh the Palace of Versailles uh, basically, the Palace of Versailles, um, you might know it because it's where uh, Mary Antoinette lived. Um, and we, I hope we all know her. Um, it's located in uh, Ile de France, which is basically this little island in the middle of like Paris, where like the royalty kind of congregated at and lived at. Um, so approximately from 1682, Louis XIV decided this is going to be the place where like all the royals lived. And it was about that way for about a hundred and something years until Louis the 17th rolled around, who was um, the husband of Marie, Fred, uh, Marie Antoinette. Um, due to the French Revolution, a lot of stuff went down and, you know, no one lives there anymore. But it has become like the most iconic places because inside they have some place called the Hall of Mirrors, where you basically walk down and it's just literally a hallway of mirrors where you can see yourself, see beautiful paintings on the ceiling, and it's just really gorgeous. Um, it's also pretty interesting. It's like the Biltmore Estate. Um, you get to see a lot of historical stuff, how they lived, how they slept, how they dress. In fact, the Biltmore Estate did get some ideas from the Palace of Versailles, so just a little fun tidbit. Um, the next iconic uh, landmark we can see is Notre Dame de Paris. Um, the Notre Dame de Paris, um, if y'all remember last year, actually uh, had a, like a fire breakout, but for the most part, it survived. Um, I added this because when we got, had gone there, you couldn't actually go inside, like you see the people you see on the, like, the entrance. Um, it was blocked off when he had gone and because, due to the fire. Um, a little history behind it is it was started construction in like 1260 and it took a while to finish because building cathedrals take a long time. It's not quite instantaneous. Um, and it's been around since then. However, it has been burned down a couple of times, not to the extent where it's like on the ground, but um, some damage and stuff. So the fire last year isn't too bad. It can always be reconstructed. Um, but another famous tidbit, you all remember the Hunchback of Notre Dame? Um, the book actually managed to save the actual, like, structure itself because it made it so famous. A lot of people, like, started to visit, um, which is a little fun little tidbit. Um, for the next, uh, place I visited, it was the Louvre, which is the most famous museum out there in the world. Um, it houses a lots and lots of iconic images you've seen over your lifetime, like the Mona Lisa, the Thinking Man, a whole bunch of um, Egyptian relics and items that's been collected from all over the world. Um, in the past, there used to also be another palace <laughs> um, that was uh, built by Philip II. Um, but around the 18th century, it was turned into a museum and stuff, and then they added that little pyramid that you see in the middle later on. But when we had gone there, um, we had actually gotten lost because it takes a long, long time to actually view all those paintings and it's, as much as they try, sometimes you just wander in and wander out. Um, fun tidbit also, there's apparently like, like a train station underneath there, if I remember correctly. Or is that Palace of Versailles? Eh, I think they both actually have it. Um, next up we get to the host city that I lived in. Uh, so ours is a little tiny town in the south of France, located kind of close to the, um, the beach, but not quite. It's about a 30-minute drive or so. Um, I lived there for about like six weeks, six or seven weeks um, with my host family. Um, so I got that immersive like language experience. Um, this town is really, really old. It's been around since like the Roman era. Um, as you can see in the picture, there's like, you know, some Roman features that you can see, like an amphitheater or like, you know, a theater in general that they used to do plays in and stuff um and it's very just very lively place during the summer to have a photo festival that like a lot of people come to so they'll set up like art exhibits all around the city we can travel to and see different people's like you know photos of the world and how they see things um and that's about it um and this next little picture pretty much i don't say pretty much sums up what ours is but it gives like a glimpse into like the traditions and stuff um so just play the video real quick Thank 
Um, okay, so there's two things in this photo that uh, uh, this video I wanted y'all to see, uh, hear and see. The first are the dresses that they're wearing. Uh, these are the traditional clothing that um, a lot of people during the 1800s in the city wore. And it's like quite iconic. If y'all remember uh, Vincent van Gogh, um, he actually drew a lot of pictures of them in these dresses and they're really beautiful. Every summer they have a little festival where um, all the women will dress up in these. They'll get their hair done, they'll get their hats done, um, and they'll go walking throughout the streets just showing off all the designs and patterns and stuff. Um, I also, like, we passed by a window shop one day and we saw that the little hat itself actually cost 300 euros, um, which is a little sad for me because I actually wanted to get one, but it was not in the books. Um, the second thing I wanted y'all to see, well, well, here, was the music. Um, so this music was pro pro produced by Alphonse Dode, um, and this is based off a play by someone named uh, Didier. Uh, basically, it's just a story about, like, you know, a girl from Arl who a man, like, you know, is chasing after, but it's a whole melodrama that happens. But this is, those are the two things it's mainly known for. Um, the beautiful dresses and, like, the lovely upbeat music. Um, next, we're going to move on to Espace Van Gogh. So this is a little hospital uh, that was functioning back in the 1800s. Um, it has, like, a middle little courtyard, as y'all can see. Um, with a whole bunch of beautiful flowers and like um, basically anyone who's on recovery from surgery or like you know uh, mental breakdowns or stuff like that would stay here. And in fact Vincent van Gogh himself, uh, himself experienced an episode and had to stay here in the year 1888 for a while. And while he was here he like you know drew actual pictures and like got inspiration from the people in the surroundings. Um, so as you can see on the little left um, right a little garden in the hospital of Arles. That's the picture he drew uh, closer to the fall when everything was dying and stuff. But otherwise, it's still a pretty beautiful picture. And I really enjoyed visiting there. Um, the next one would be um, L'Amphitheatre um, or Lorraine. Uh, basically, this is the old Roman um, stadium um, where everything would go down. It has a long, long history. So, you know, it's, it was built to, you know, basically entertain the populace and, you know, keep it or, you know, make sure everyone followed along with, like, you know, rules and stuff. Um, however, like, over the years, it fell into disrepair. In fact, at one point in time during the medieval century, people, like, took the stones from the sides to make a little village inside of it because of, like, you know, sieges and stuff. Um, but then it was reconstructed later on, closer to the 1800s, um, for, like, you know, tourism and stuff like that. Um, however, nowadays, it's mainly used for, like, bull jumping. Um, basically the idea of like bull jumping is a whole bunch of guys get into a ring with a bull and they attempt to get this little um, item. It's like between, it's tied between its horn on a string. Um, and you also have to manage to avoid being hit by the bull. Um, so it's very like, I went to one, it was very interesting to watch. Um, a little scary at times, but interesting to watch. Um, and they also have like plays, not plays, but they have little, um, acting things that go on here as well. So they would like do little presentations and things for the whole city. I know a school, um, my host sister had like a whole little performance here um, that her school had put on for like the rest of the city to see. You know, it was very interesting and very nice to see how like it works like, you know, modern day community standards. The next uh, landscape, well, next city we're gonna talk about is um, Avignon. Um, Avignon is a larger city than Arles, um, located a little more to like, you know, the west uh, than Avignon um, and it's nicknamed like the city of popes and stuff like that. There's a lot of theater, there's a lot of acting and stuff. When we had gone there we had seen a whole bunch of um, posters and signs and everything of like you know different tropes, different acting uh, groups and stuff and in fact there were actually like people on the streets dressed in their uh, characters costumes and everything. It was really interesting to see um, but the one landmark that I really wanted y'all to see um, was the Palais de Pape, uh, Palais de Pops. Um, this is basically the old, um, actually I want to say like the largest structure, not the largest structure in the city, but one of the oldest. Um, it's an old like, you know, palace that was constructed for the Pope that moved there back in like the 13th century. So around this time, like, you know, there's a lot of division about Pope uh, Clement V uh, being voted in and to avoid any like anything from happening, he decided he was going to move the whole like papal um, congregation to Avignon just to be safe. However, this led to a bit of a clash because while he was away, um, some popes in Rome, uh, someone elected their own pope in Rome, which now there was a whole two-pope system, which kind of went on for a while, but quickly sorted itself out. 
but um, we went on a tour here for my class. Um, and it was really interesting because you get to see a lot of the rooms and how like, you know, um, the kitchens, the giant like fire um, fireplaces, like there was at least a fireplace the size of like three people laying across. Um, we also got to see like, um, not only the dungeon, but it was um, basically at the belly of the palace and stuff like that. Um, it was really interesting and I enjoyed it. <laughs> Uh, and that's pretty much it. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Amanda and this is a little bit about me. Um, so I am a senior global studies major at UNC with a concentration in um, Latin America and global health and environment. And I was able to do a study abroad semester in Dubrovnik, Croatia, where I spent about five months there. And I also did a summer internship in Santiago, Chile um, this past summer. Um, and I am from Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I am a first generation college student. Okay, and to start, um, I just have a quick poll question um, for everyone to answer. So. Has anyone traveled to Croatia or Chile or both possibly? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so it looks like most people haven't been able to visit Croatia or Chile, which is fine. I had a feeling maybe that's um, would be the case, but Hope you guys can still learn something um, really interesting and some new information today. Okay, so a little bit um, about Croatia, just in case you're not sure where it is. Um, so from RDU to Dubrovnik, Croatia, which is where I studied abroad, it's about 17 hour um, flight, which for me, it took a little bit longer, like an extra 10 hours to get there. Um, but there's a map and if you can see, it's to the, um, east of Italy and it's down south towards Greece in the um, Balkan region. Okay, and here I have a map up close of Croatia. And if you can see, it's right on the coast. It's in the Adriatic Sea, like I said, to the east of Italy. And Croatia is actually made up of over a thousand different islands in addition to the mainland. Um, so there's lots of coastline, lots of beaches there. And the main city is Zagreb, which has about half a million people. It's the capital city. And if you go down to the very south in Dubrovnik, um, that is where I spent my study abroad semester. Mm -hmm. And one interesting fact about Croatia is that it actually has the most days of sunshine in all of Europe. Um, so it's considered the sunniest country in Europe, which is really interesting. Okay, for those of you that don't know much about Croatia, it has lots of diverse ecological landscapes. It has lots of beaches, mountains, um, the Daneric Alps are there, lots of waterfalls and national parks, different islands. Like I said, there's over a thousand islands. They have a really good football or soccer team who actually went to the World Cup in 2018. They went to the um, final, unfortunately, unfortunately they lost to France. And they have lots of world heritage sites, um, cities and lots of churches and other religious sites as well. Okay, so my first landmark in Croatia is Plivitsa National Park, um, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and it's an outdoor area. It's made up of about 16 different lakes and lots of different waterfalls. Um, and unfortunately, you can't swim there, but you can take boat, boat rides through and walk around and view like all the natural landscapes. And personally, for me, this was my favorite, one of my favorite places I got to visit in Croatia um, because the pictures just don't do it justice, but it really is beautiful. And um, another really interesting landmark, in case you've ever seen the TV show Game of Thrones, um, is the Dubrovnik Walls. Part of that TV show was filmed here. But a little bit about the history of the Dubrovnik Walls is that it was mainly built um, between the 7th and 17th century, um, but mainly finished around the 14th century. So they're hundreds of years old, um, and they're still kept up to this day. But so the old city or downtown er area of Dubrovnik is an ancient walled city, a medieval walled city. Um, and this was to protect against sea invaders. So these walls made Dubrovnik a really um, important and powerful seaport um, hundreds of years ago. 
And just a little tidbit about Dubrovnik, that's the city where I was able to study abroad. And I lived right outside of the walls. And my next landmark is really interesting. It's the Zadar Sea Organ. And Zadar is a city uh, more in North Croatia. And what happens, it's an art installation. So the water rushes on to the steps of the sea organ and the water of the Adriatic Sea pretty much plays the organ. So it's constantly making music, which is really interesting. And another interesting fact is that Zadar um, allegedly has the most beautiful sunset in the world, according to Alfred, Hitch Alfred Hitchcock. So lots of people come and sit in this area to listen to the sea organ play and to watch the sunset, which is something I was able to do. It was really nice. And here I have a short video so you can hear sort of what the sea organ sounds like. Okay, and that's probably good. Thank you, Liz. Okay. So my um, next landmark is Lokrum Island, which is an island off the coast of Dubrovnik. It's pretty small, but it used to be the summer residence of an Austrian archduke. Um, and so this was a summer residence and he actually had um, different plants and flora brought in from all continents except Antarctica. So there's tons of different types of plants here on this um, one island. And he also imported peacocks from India, which is really interesting. So there's tons of peacocks that just walk around the island and they live there. And another interesting fact is that nobody is allowed to live on the island except for an emergency fire department team. Because if you spend the night there, the island's thought to be cursed, so nobody lives there. You can just visit during the day. And it's a short boat, boat ride from the medieval walled city of Dubrovnik over to this island. Okay, and my next landmark is Diocletian's Palace, which more so than a palace, it was a really large fortress that took up over half of the city of Split, which is where it's located in about the middle of Croatia. And the palace was for a um, ancient Roman emperor, Diocletian. So it was his living space and also a big fortress for his military to live as well. Um, and this was built in about the fourth century. So it's really, really old and you can still see part of it stands today, like in this photo I have for you. And other parts are made into museums, but like I said, it takes up almost half of the city is split. So people live and have their apartments or homes within these walls. There's restaurants, stores, hotels, museums, everything. People just live their daily lives out of this big palace, which is really interesting. Okay, and my next country I want to focus on uh, moving out of Europe and into South America is Chile. And if you can see on the left, I have a map from RDU to Santiago, which is where I did my summer internship, about 14 hours. Um, and if you look on the right, I have another map. So Chile is located in South America, and it's on the Pacific Ocean. And it's really, really long and skinny, and it stretches down towards Antarctica. But because of its shape, it's so long, it has many different ecological areas and lots and lots of different beautiful landscapes, which is really interesting. And to the east is Argentina and up north is Peru. Okay, and Chile has um, penguins, lots of deserts, mountains, um, the Andes mountain range is there, as well as Patagonia, part of Patagonia. They have lots of active volcanoes, really large cities. Um, Santiago has over 8 million people that live there, which is the capital city of Chile. The picture of it down there on the bottom. And they also have lots of beaches too because their coastline is so long. Okay, and my um, first landmark is Easter Island, which I'm sure some of you may have seen before. And the most notable, or Noticeable features of Easter Island is the Moai statues, which were made hundreds and hundreds of years ago by the early inhabitants of Easter Island. And each statue is made out of stone and it can weigh up to 14 tons or about 30,000 pounds. So it's a really big mystery to historians today about how these early inhabitants were able to move these statues around when they weighed 30,000 pounds, which is really interesting. 
Okay, my um, next landscape in Chile is the Atacama Desert, which is the largest desert in Chile, and it's also the driest desert in the world, um, which is really interesting. And because it's so dry, um, there's not very many people that live there, but in the past, there's lots of mummified remains of the early inhabitants there because it's so dry, their bodies never decompose. Um, there's also very, very few people that live there today. And my last landscape in Chile is Magdalena Island, um, which is known for being a penguin reserve. And it's located sort of right in the middle of Chile. It's an island off the coast of Punta Arenas. Um, and a lot of people, when they think of South America, they don't necessarily think of penguins, but Chile's so long and goes so far south, it sort of reaches down towards um, Antarctica, which is really interesting. And to the right, I have a short video just showing um, some of what the reserve looked like and some of the penguins there. Okay, great. And that was all of the famous places and landscapes that we have for you. But so for our final activity, if you are with somebody and you wanna to talk to someone around you or just think to yourself, um, what landmark or place you would wanna visit the most and why? And if you would like to, you can go ahead and type your answer into the chat and we'll be able to read some of those. Mm -hmm. You can also answer the poll question as well about which country you would want to visit the most. Great, I saw somebody answered the place with the penguins, which I think is really cool too. Someone said they would like to go to France. <clears throat> Team France, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a lot of people like the penguin reserve. We'll give another 10 France. seconds or so for the poll. Someone else said France everywhere. And then some people Oh, someone would like to go to see the haunted place and um, someone else wants to go to France. All right. So here's the results of the poll. Okay. So it looks like everyone, the majority of people want to go to all of the places. Okay, and now it's time for some Q&A. So if you can go down to the bottom of the screen and select the Q&A button, and either yourself or an adult can um, type in the question for you. And. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think we've got a couple of questions okay. already. Um, <clears throat> so one said, didn't Croatia soccer team actually tie France, but the referee called something wrong? So I don't know if you got to see that game, Amanda, or not. I did watch that game, and I'm not so sure that I remember, but I believe the score was about five to two. So I think France did have a couple more points, but like I said, I don't remember everything. So that could have been the case that they made some bad calls too. And do you know why they call it Easter Island? I actually do not know why they call it Easter Island. Mm -hmm. That's something interesting that you could look up on your own time after the presentation <laughs> too. Mm -hmm. Um, did either of you travel outside of the country you were studying? And if so, where did you get to go? Um, do you want to go first, Amanda? Yeah, sure. So during my um, time in Croatia, I was able to travel a lot, especially in like Eastern Europe. So I was able to go to a lot of countries in the Balkan region, like Croatia, Slovenia, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I also got to go down south to Greece and um, to the west to Italy. 
And when on my way home, I was able to stop in um, Germany and Ireland. But when I was in Chile, I just stayed in Chile the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, for me, when I was in France, I only went to one place and that was Switzerland. A lot of our weekends were taking up with little fun activities inside like our actual like host uh, city and stuff. But I went to Geneva and I visited, uh, well, Geneva the city. And um, I went to visit uh, Zurich. Um, I went hiking. <laughs> first time for everything um and I visited like the UN building um that's located there it was really fun to see there's a giant chair outside of the UN like building for some reason I'm not sure what the ch chair is supposed to represent but it was just fun to look at and take pictures with um we also got a lot of chocolate while we were there <laughs> and for Hong Kong um we only visited Macau and Shanghai that was it <laughs> all right um another one I don't know if you know this or not, Amanda, do you know the story behind the haunted place in Croatia by chance? I know a little bit. So the island is um, called Lokrim Island. And when the, I believe when the Archduke left, he wanted to curse the island. And there's also a monastery on the island. So the monks went around the island three times with candles and they cursed the island. So the story says, so that anyone who stays there overnight would also be cursed from what I remember. I'm sure there's a little more to the story, but I know it's something about the monks going around the island and cursing it. Um, there's another question of how many places have you been so far? So I don't know if this is how many different countries maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, I've probably been to about um, 15 or 16 different countries. Um, for me, I think um, it's probably about five. <laughs> Um, so, um, a teacher asked, can you tell my students why they might want to study abroad someday? Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, I was able to study abroad because I have a scholarship at UNC that was able to pay for um, part of my semester to go abroad, which is really nice. But I think it's definitely an eye-opening experience and you're able to experience um, a lot of new, like different cultures and come in contact with new people that you otherwise wouldn't have met um, staying in the United States or just staying in North Carolina. And it really opens your eyes to a lot of um, new experiences too. And you get to meet a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like Amanda said, it opens a whole bunch of horizons and stuff. So like go abroad and like, you know, spend time in a different culture. For me, um, Hong Kong, Hong Kong for me was just the first, not the first time. Actually, yeah, it was the first time I went across outside of the country and it was like, you know, a 180 shift because there's lots of differences between Western culture and like, you know, Eastern culture. So you got to see like the different types of food, different types of transportation system, um, different types of pastries. I will say Hong Kong has some of the best pastries out there. <laughs> so if you ever visit, go there. <laughs> um, and for me, um, I had gone to France, like, you know, to get better at French. So also, also opportunity to like, you know, um, to become like bilingual, to better your, like, your language skills and stuff like that to communicate. <laughs> Um, it says, how do they keep the penguins cold in the penguin reserve and that they're so cute? <laughs> yes, they're very cute. So actually, since like Chile is so long, like it stretches towards Antarctica. So it's cold there like a really large part of the year. <clears throat> and during the summer, there's not so much they can do about the weather. So I'm sure the penguins have just um, adapted. But even though it is a penguin reserve, that's their natural habitat. Like they weren't... Um, taken from down south and placed there, they always live there. And now it's just a protected area. So I'm sure the penguins just have adapted to warm weather, but it definitely is um, cold there for a large part of the year too. Um, there's another question about what the technology was like um, in the places that you guys have been in France, in Chile, Croatia, was it similar? Was it different? It was pretty similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah I would say it was pretty similar as well. Um, I can't think of anything really different because I had, you know, Wi-Fi a lot of places and my computer always worked, which is the mm -hmm. main technology I'm using. And like cell service is normal everywhere else as well. So I'd say it's pretty similar, yeah. Yeah, the one little fun tip that I remember is there's a difference between Wi-Fi pa uh, wi passwords. So mm -hmm. here's a kind of short and memorable. When my host mom told me the Wi-Fi password, it was at least 50 letters long and a whole sentence. And I was like, are all of them like this? Yeah. Like, kind of? She's like, the, the city actually, or like the company gives you one. It's kind of randomly generated, but yeah. <laughs> well, when I was in Croatia, the Wi-Fi password for everything was 
zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> which is really interesting. But I also think something interesting to note too is like as college students, we're able to like live in these areas like through our school and stuff that have Wi-Fi, but it's also important to note lots of people in Croatia and Chile and I'm sure France too don't have as mm -hmm. much access to technology as we do too. I'm sure for me and Sade, it was easy for us to find Wi-Fi, um, but that's probably because of like our living situations and where we were placed. But for example, if you go out to like a more rural area of Chile or Croatia, I'm sure it's a lot harder um, to find like internet or um, Wi-Fi or different technologies like that. Mm -hmm. So you definitely can find them, but not everyone might have the same access to them like we do here in the United States for sure. Yeah, another question. What are some of the things that Croatia is known for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Croatia is known for having lots of beautiful beaches. It's a really big vacation spot for people that live in Europe. So during the summertime, people love to come and vacation there. Um, and some recent history in the 1990s, it was known um, for the breakup of Yugoslavia. And there was a really big civil war there. So a lot of your parents probably know about that. Um, but nowadays, it's a really big vacation spot. And I can say from my experience there, it's very safe and everything, but a lot of people might associate it um, in the past with the Civil War that happened about 30 years ago. And similar question, which we can also do for France, mm -hmm. um, what is Chile known for? Mm -hmm. um, I think Chile is known for having, like I said, it's so long and skinny. There's so many different landscapes there, like deserts, the Andes mountain range is there, which is really huge. And also um, Patagonia is there, which is a really huge um, area down south. Um, beautiful like natural landscapes and things like that and if you've never heard of it um, I definitely recommend that you look it up after this presentation it's really interesting and I don't know if you want to answer that as well for France should I oh um what isn't France known for <laughs> <laughs> basically at this point I think France is just known for being France like it's like in all the movies all the Americans in films go there and stuff like that. It's just known for it's like beauty, the people, just the atmosphere and everything. Like, you know, it's the ideal place people think of when they want to go study abroad. <laughs> um, and do you know about the po population of Croatia, Amanda? I believe there's about four and a half million people that live there. Mm -hmm. So not too big. And we have a question of how many museums are there? I'm not sure for which country, but you don't have to, I'm sure you guys don't know the exact number, but if you want to talk a little bit about maybe a museum that you went to or, or some of the museums in the countries, you can. Yeah, definitely. Um, Croatia has lots of different museums. One in Dubrovnik is um, about the civil war that happened there and specifically in Dubrovnik, which is really interesting. And one that's not so much a museum, but for the old city walls, you're actually able to go up to the top and walk around the whole city, which is really interesting. There's lots of history on the way and stuff, which is very cool. Um, for France, there's a lot of museums. It's just, it's a lot. Uh, there's at least, I remember passing by three museums in France, but like a lovely tidbit, like a lot of them for like, are kind of cheaper for like anyone who's 25 years and uh, under and stuff. So if you want to go visit these like multitude of like museums, you can do so. <laughs> Um, there's some questions, a few different people, about um, the weather in the different countries, maybe the areas you were in, or maybe some of the diversity in the weather in different regions. Yeah, so like I said, Croatia actually has really nice weather, um, lots of beaches, and it's pretty warm, especially down south where I was for the most part. And a lot of times it reminds me of North Carolina weather. It's pretty moderate winters and really hot summers. Um, but the further north you go and more into Central Europe, it gets a little colder. Um, and when I went to visit the capital of Zagreb, um, the biggest city in Croatia was actually the coldest day they've ever had on record in the past 15 years or so. Um, so it was a little colder when I was there, but it was still really nice. And then Chile is just so long. There's so many different types of um, weather. Um, but in Santiago, where I was at, it actually has like a Mediterranean climate. So it's really similar to um, Croatia or Greece, maybe. Um, uh, for France in Paris, um, it was kind of like, it kind of felt like here in um, North Carolina and stuff. Uh, basically, it was windy. It was cool. You didn't need like too much like, you know, white clothing. Actually, you might have needed the jacket for some parts. But when you got closer to like Arles and stuff, like it's in the south of France, um, it's a lot hotter there. In fact, there was a middle of a heat wave. It got to like 107 degrees while we were there to the point we had to cancel schools because it was too hot. Um, 
but that's like a one-time thing it is warm regularly and like you would need sunscreen like clothing and stuff like that and it's always like sunny um it's not humid though that's the good thing humid and uh, if it was humid and hot you'd just be melting away <laughs> Yeah, definitely Croatia or Chile is not as humid as it is here in North Carolina, but it still can get really hot. Um, and it says, are there good foods in Croatia? So maybe you guys can talk about one of your favorite dishes in each of the countries that you've been to. Yeah, definitely. So Croatia actually has a really, a lot of really good food. So the more on the coast you are, the more similar the food is to Italy. And since they're on the Adriatic Sea, they have lots of seafood. So one of the main dishes that Croatia is known for is black cuttlefish risotto. So cuttlefish is a type of fish that lives in the Adriatic Sea. And then it, um, you pair it with black risotto, which is like black rice pretty much, which is something Dubrovnik is known for. But then also they're located in the Balkan region in Eastern Europe. So they have a lot of dishes that involve like meat and potatoes and cabbage and things like that, which is really good too. So they have a really diverse range of different types of foods, but it's really good. And was, did you have a favorite chade of food for France or in Hong Kong? Oh, let me think. Um, Hong Kong, they have something called um, honey buns or like honey. Uh, it's like this weird bun. It's made out of honey. Like pineapple buns. There we go. Pineapple buns. Mm -hmm. The best pastry ever. Um, I love it. I will vouch for it till the day it, till the world ends. Um, but for France, um, the one I liked the most, I think. So, you know, remember the movie Gratitude? You know that little, um, the actual dish ratatouille? We actually managed to have it there. Um, and I think that was my favorite only because my childhood came back at that moment. I'm like, I'm eating ratatouille like the movie. <laughs> right. um, do you happen to know if there are crocodiles or alligators in Chile, <laughs> Amanda? Um, that is something I don't know. Um, I would just, I don't know. I definitely, I think, um, maybe to more of the east, maybe in Brazil or in the Amazon, but since Chile is separated by the Andes mountain range, I'm not so sure if there's any crocodiles or alligators in Chile. Um, right. um, what is your favorite place that you each went to? Um, um, oh, do you want to go no, okay um so there was this place that, it's not like an official thing but like so outside of Arles, there's a lot of like ruins and stuff like of old bridges and aqueducts that the romans had built and one day to my host mom to help me out with my um, photography class she took me out there like like past like the whole like you know fields of like you know all of the stuff um and it was just a whole bunch of like ruins like on top of this mountain and then we looked on like across the mountain you could see like everything and i think that was my favorite place <laughs> nice uh, within Croatia, I really, really love Dubrovnik, um, but my favorite place to visit, I guess, when I was there, I really like the city of Zadar, where the sea organ was at, and I also love visiting um, the Plivica National Park, which was beautiful, mm -hmm. but outside of my host country of Croatia, I was able to go travel to Slovenia, and I went to the capital city of Ljubljana, and that was one of my favorite places I got to travel to. There's a question about if they eat crab in, I think it was for Croatia, maybe, mm -hmm. I'm guessing maybe they do with the coast, but I don't know if you ate it when you're there or not. Yeah, I never had crab while I was there, but in Chile, definitely they eat crab too. And they also eat a lot of seafood just because they're on the coast. Um, and I didn't have, like I said, I didn't have any crab myself when I was in Croatia, but that doesn't mean they don't have it. Just not 100% sure. Was there much seafood in Arl, uh, Shade? I want to say yes. I mean, it's a bit of a distance still from the ocean. There is like a river, but you can't fish there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say yes, there is seafood, but I never ordered any. <laughs> okay. There's um, another question is, does Croatia have a lot of green land? So is there maybe a lot of rural areas that are more open, not developed? Or how mm -hmm. does it kind of balance out between rural and urban areas? Yeah, definitely. There are a lot of rural areas in Croatia, a lot of green land. Um, the biggest city is the capital city, which is Zagreb, and the city itself, there's only about 500,000 people. So, um, there's lots of like open space between cities, and most of the cities aren't that large, so there's lots of um, rural area. But also Croatia is located in the Alps. I believe it's 
the Dinaric or the Juliana Alps. There's a lot of mountainous areas too that might be hard um, for large groups of people to live in. Um, and someone said, are you allowed to stay overnight at the Croatia island or is it just recommended? I'm not sure which one they're referring to, maybe you know. <laughs> yeah, so probably for the island of Lokram, nobody's allowed to stay there overnight. Um, you have to leave unless you're part of the fire department team that has to sleep there. But no guests are allowed to stay. I think some people have to go, but are there any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Those are all great questions, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Anything that we missed? All right, I think we got most of the questions. So just to give you guys a heads up, we have one more presentation today at 2.30. So we'll be back then. Our last presentation of the day is on traditional foods in India and Spain, and it's an all levels presentation. Um, and it should especially be good, I think, for the younger students as well. So we'll be back for that. Um, and we appreciate you guys joining us for the session. And thank you so much, Amanda and Shade, for sharing all of that information with us. So we will see some of you back for the next session. Um, and have a good rest of the day, you guys. Great. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.